Um, let me begin by saying that this is really quite an honor. Um, uh, I can hardly believe it, in fact. Uh, what I do want to say also is that I'm embarrassed that I don't know more about Alfred Korzybski's work. Um, I have known about it peripherally. I've read little bits here and there. Um, so please don't expect me to be on top of it here. Um, and I'm looking forward to being educated if, I, if you have the time. Um, what I do want to do today, however, is talk about something I thought was interesting. That in his work, that little bit that I do know, um, he was very antagonistic to Aristotle, uh, the father of, uh, of much of Western philosophy. Um, and what I want to do today is to say, yes, he's right. And yes, don't throw out the baby with the bath. Uh, and I want to bring in some of what he didn't talk about, actually, but I think turns out to be crucial to a lot of his thinking. And this has to do with the very concept of semantics, the concept of representation, the concept of how something can be about something. Um, and so this is not quite the subtitle that I put on uh, the, the program, but it's the same thing. Uh, re rediscovering the physical origins of final causality. Final causality is Aristotle's term for something you might call purposiveness, though I will expand on that quite a bit. Um, I, I begin with this picture. It's actually uh, something I talk about in chapter one of my book. By the way, it starts with, with zero, not one, uh, as every good number system should. Um, uh, but uh, I talk about the throwing of a stone out on water and letting it skip. Now, we human beings, uh, I certainly as a boy and even as an adult got really excited about this, walking along the beach looking for just the right kind of stones skippable stones. Now, there's no particular identifying feature that means skippable stone. A lot of it has to do with the skill of the skipper. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about this is that um, you could know a whole lot of the physics. You could be a, a, a demon that knows where every atom in a stone came from, where every atom in the water came from. And you would have still a lot of trouble figuring out why a whole lot of flat, rounded stones are way out there and not in here, in the water. Um, but this wasn't the case before people. Um, it took people to do this. And it turns out that uh, one kid watching this happen, um, it's so fascinating to see stones that should fall through the water stay above the water long enough um, that you just want to do it and do it and do it. Um, something unusual came into the world with a human mind that gets fascinated by this, gets fascinated by this way that some process in nature can seemingly violate what ought to be the case. Um, and uh, it's that emergence, the emergence of that unique feature that I want to focus on. And I want to do it at a very elementary level. So today, we're probably not going to get to anything like minds or brains, even though, yes, I am a neuroscientist and love to talk about brains under certain circumstances. Tonight, I want to get much more general. So I want to begin with what I call the riddle of the final cause. And I'll, I've tried to put this in as simple a terms as I can. How can functions of organisms and the content of thoughts, which lack material and energetic properties, these are not things that are out there in the world that you can grab hold of. How can they have physical efficacy that's sufficient to make things happen in the world, that can bring things about? How can the idea of a particular goal make that goal come about in the world if that idea doesn't have mass, charge, uh, momentum, and so on? The idea is, is not any of those things. The real mystery is how something like a purpose can exist and how it can have influence in the world um, if it's not physical in all the senses we think it is. Well, the problem with the way we struggle with this is that we tend to fall into two camps. And uh, in the middle, you see Rene Descartes, who is sort of the man who forces us into these two camps. On the left, there's the camp um, where there's a little guy in the head that's doing all the work. Uh, the problem with this, of course, is that there's a little guy in his head that's doing all the work. And a little guy in that head that's doing all the work. Um, uh, that's how come it happens. Well, that's not very helpful. Uh, the other side of it is that, oh, no, it's just some machine up there, some computer that's doing the work. It's just computing it. And all of this stuff about my purpose, my meaning, my values, um, that's all trivial stuff. Uh, well, in effect, it's, it's not very helpful. 
And in fact, there's ways that people sort of do versions of this, what I call the homunculus move, putting a little guy in the story. And one of those is to say, well, you know, it can never be explained. It's just there. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's sort of the mysterious view. It's an it's a inevitable mystery. It will never be solved. The other way to do it is say, no, it's, it's there everywhere. Um, uh, it's always been there. Cognition has always been there. Experience has always been there. It's just that we have a special collection of it in our heads. Um, probably the most famous current version of this comes from the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, who had the idea that to some extent in every single subatomic event, there's a sort of essence of experience, an attempt to sort of complete themselves, so to speak, that that drives things forward. Um, uh, unfortunately, these are non-explanations. They are just saying, oh, no, let's just po posit it out there. It just is there. I can't deal with it. That's why it's a mystery. Um, uh, the other side, of course, is I can say, uh, <laughs> come on, you guys. It's, it, we're just machines. It's just a fancy kind of computer made up, yeah, OK, of, of you know, uh, different kinds of material, but it's just computing stuff. Um, uh, this view is oftentimes called eliminative materialism. What it says is that once we really understand the brain, we won't have to talk about purposes or meanings or values anymore because we'll find out it's just electrical potentials and it's just chemistry. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll have the chemistry down and all this other stuff will disappear. Psychology is a science can disappear. Yes, people can play around with this you know, for fun, but we really know it's just machinery. Um, there's a third view, a middle view. Uh, here I show it and with Descartes saying that the two views never come together. There's attempt oftentimes to put these together. Sometimes it's called dual aspect theory. What this means is that everything in nature has both a sort of physical extended feature and a sort of experiential feature to it. Um, unfortunately, it, it, I think it's also a cryptic dualism because it basically says, I've got two things I'm not going to explain, but I'm also not going to explain the fact that they always come together. Um, so the problem is, uh, on the left, it's a vicious regress. It's, you know, little guys within little guys within little guys. On the right, it's a reductio ad absurdum because, you know, who's the computer that's fooled by the computer? Um, so now let me get to Korzybski. That's the problem. The problem is we have to solve this conundrum. Um, Korzybski starts, one of, this is a quote from a, a piece that I picked up, and you, know, you can correct me if I get Korzybski wrong at every step. Um, the present non-Aristotelian system is based on a fundamental negative premise, or fundamental negative premises, namely the complete denial of identity. Uh, in fact, there's two things that I think Korzybski has trouble with when I read what I know of his work. And that is the identity story, uh, that A equals A, that, uh, that a representation is identical with what it represents, or that there's some kind of equation between them. But also the excluded middle story, um, that I think is also a problem. Excluded middle is what's necessary to make uh, most symbolic logic work. We struggle with coming up with different kinds of logics that help us overcome this problem. But these were two major principles that drove Aristotle's logic. Um, Here's the problem that I think Korzybski, I'm standing back again, uh, from this work that, that I think he sees in this. That is, importing this vision, uh, imposing it, that is, on the physical world, treats everything as mechanism. Nice, discrete parts that interact, that are either identical to each other, or they're in some kind of mutually exclusive relationship to each other. Paradoxically, this leads to the abandonment of Aristotle's notion of final causality. Now, what I think Korzybski is reacting to, and again, again, it's my outside perspective, is that in effect, it flattens nature. It takes out the flexibility, the multivariate nature of the world, the plurality of reference that exists, the softness of things, um, that treating the world mathematically, for example, um, divides it up into a nice, neat way so that things are determined. Because in mathematics, things are determined. Um, so we look at the world, and it looks like it's nice, crisp mechanism. Um, the problem is mechanisms have no meaning. Mechanisms have no values. Mechanisms are just mechanisms. Um, so what I want to do today is 
to bring Aristotle back into Korsipski's world. Um, and um, not everything about Aristotle, because I think he was right to throw some things out. Um, but what I want to bring back is to say, let's go back to Aristotle's notion of causality, a plurality of causality, a causality that's not just mechanistic, and try to figure out, first of all, what happened to it, and then find out if there's a baby in this bath. Now, Aristotle famously came up with four ways of thinking about causality. Um, by that, he means when we explain something, what caused something to be? And he said there's material cause, efficient cause, formal cause, and final cause. Four different ways of talking about how things are caused to happen. Material cause, um, the intrinsic nature of something, efficient cause, sort of the mechanical side of things, the forced nature of things. Formal cause, um, you might think about the forms of things, the constraints, the plans of things. And final cause is the purpose, the aim, the goal. Um, Aristotle famously used the phrase, uh, translated of course, that for the sake of which something occurs. Um, so one of the examples that he uses, for example, is walking for one's health. Um, that's why you walk, um, for one's health. That's the, for the sake of which you're walking. Walking is an efficient process. Um, nevertheless, um, the cause, the reason you're doing it is more complicated than that. Let me give you an example. Just think about building a house from Aristotle's point of view. The material cause has to do with the solidity of brick. Why do you choose the things that you use to build this house? Because they have certain properties. Um, they have certain strengths. They don't do things. Uh, they can resist a certain kind of pressure. The efficient cause is basically what the carpenter is doing. He's cutting things. He's moving things. He's attaching them together. He's shifting things around with respect to each other. The formal cause, of course, are the forms that are required. Um, first of all, he has a design in mind, a, a plan before it's there. But more appropriately, there are certain forms that you have to utilize. If you're going to build an arch, you've got to do it certain ways. If you're going to support a roof, you have to do it in certain ways. Um, there are restrictions in nature that have to do with form. Uh, and that's part of what goes into building a house as well. You can't just do anything. You can't just use any material. You can't just put them together in any possible way. But what's the final cause? Well, it's the goal. What's the goal of building a house? Well, it's not the house. The goal of building is a house is to provide shelter, maybe from the weather, maybe protection, maybe warmth, whatever. Um, that's the sake for which this is done. Um, so that's the final cause. And I'm going to focus on final cause today, because we in the scientific world, in the natural sciences, really don't tend to like final causality. We don't like things to have purposes. Um, because the world is, come on, just a machine, right? Well, what basically happened um, in the Enlightenment is that we s systematically got rid of three of these. Um, and material cause, well, it kind of disappeared because we eventually figured out that, that you know, things were atom, made up of atoms, and atoms had certain properties, but those properties could be explained efficiently by mechanical-like forces. We got rid of formal cause, although hidden in our mathematics are still sort of formal claims. Um, nevertheless, it's sort of been set aside when we think about why things happen. Uh, final cause turns out to be a particularly bad case uh, that we wanted to get rid of. And in part, there's good reasons to get rid of final cause, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And we got left with uh, the Newtonian kind of cause, the push-pull causality of mechanism. Um, so Newton, in effect, uh, becomes the answer to Aristotle by getting rid of the plurality, the complexity of causality. Um, final cause still persisted for quite a while. Uh, oftentimes, people think that Darwin's origin of species was one of the, the last nails in the coffin for final causality. That is, did Darwin come up with a kind of, kind of mechanical explanation of the complexity and the functionality of life? I'm going to argue against that in a minute. Um, but take that as it is, because historically, we have begun to fight against it. We don't like to think about evolution as having a purpose or going somewhere. Uh, the theory of natural selection is a theory that doesn't have an end driving it. Um, so why do we reject teleology? Teleology is this fancy word that came up in uh, the late Middle Ages to talk about final causality. Telos referring to an end, um, uh, an aim out there. Well, the natural sciences exclude teleological explanations for things. 
because a teleological explanation is inherently incomplete. Now, what do I mean by incomplete? When I say that the reason this guy did it is because he wanted to do it. It doesn't say how it happened. It identifies a locus and says it's, that's what's responsible. Um, a purpose, a function, um, identifies a locus but doesn't say what's happening. There's a reason to get rid of final cause in a lot of claims. Um, uh, famously, Spinoza, uh, the great philosopher, um, argued against final cause in the universe in general because he said it's just basically a black box. Um, it's we identify where it is and from where the cause emanates, but we don't talk about how it works, so to speak. And certainly to think about a cause from the future, that is, a purpose is something that's going to be done in the future. It's certainly not the future causing the present. So the problem is that neither a purpose nor a represented context, content nor a functional goal, these things actually don't physically exist. If it's a purpose, it's something that maybe will happen in the future. It doesn't exist now. So how can these things exert any physical causal influence in the world? That is a conundrum that we've been facing for millennia. So the eliminative explanation might be, well, they're all just fictions. That really is not the way it goes. Once we unpack these black boxes, we'll find nice, neat mechanism inside, and that'll handle it, and we can reduce all this talk out of here. One of my favorite, here's two of my favorite quotes about this. One is from the philosopher Jerry Fodor, who, by the way, did a lousy job of reviewing my book. Um, don't read it. Um, um, he didn't either, by the way. Um, if it isn't literally true that my wanting is causally responsible for my reaching, and my itching is causally responsible for my scratching, and my believing is causally responsible for my saying, if none of this is literally true, then practically everything I believe about anything is false and it's the end of the world. <laughs> um, basically, it hints at the intrinsic nihilism in this view. That is, there's no purpose to anything. There's no value to anything. Shouldn't surprise us that the success of science and technology and a world that's run by science and technology is also occurring at the time of an explosion of fundamentalism, where people want real value. They want unquestionable value and truth. They don't want nothing. Uh, Ilya Prigozhin, um, probably the most important thinker in terms of what we call non-equilibrium thermodynamics, something I'll talk a little bit about, um, puts it this way. We need an account of the material world in which it isn't absurd to claim that it produced us. And what he means by us is with all of these principles, all of these capacities. We need a science that tells us that this isn't crazy, that what we know to be true isn't absurd. So let me go back to Korzybski again. The map is not the territory, probably the most famous thing that everybody knows about. I mean, I even knew about this before I knew about the name that it came from. Um, he warns in this way of confusing a representation with reality. And that there are negative consequences of doing this. Well, now let me put it in another framing, a modern framing. Current theories of information and computation explicitly ignore reference and significance. They assume that all physical consequences must be determined by the physical features of the information-bearing medium. For example, your neurons in your brain or the machine states of a computer. That all the causal efficacy in the world has to come from this stuff that's there. This, in effect, treats the map as the territory and the territory as the map because there is no representation here. It's just the stuff. In the process, it denies any physical efficacy to represented content. content. It denies physical efficacy to purpose, to goals, to function. It says it's just the physics. So what is computation? I want to 
you know, those of you that don't know, don't know computers, it's simple. Computation is, I've got a set of rules, ways of manipulating symbols, moving them around. Um, if I got a machine and I can assign a symbol to one part of that machine, and the machine moves in such a way that those parts move around with respect to each other in a way that corresponds to, is isomorphic with, the way I would move symbols to do that same operation, I've done a comp computation. I have offloaded the manipulation of these symbols onto a mechanical device. That's all it is. It's a mechanism whose physical transitions from state to state are isomorphic with a given formal operation of symbol manipulation when these machine states are each assigned a given symbolic value. This mapping and the mapping of the symbols to the reference, when we want to use it to mean something, to do something, is not something in the machine. We do it. I look at those little bright spots on my screen and I assign them reference. So this is done, in effect, um, one of the things that Korsipsky also worries about. It's mapping a map to another map. That's all that's been done here. So it shouldn't surprise us that the computational metaphor is not giving us much of a good picture of what's going on in brains, for example, much less maybe what's going on in terms of the way world, the world ought to run rationally. Computation commits Korzybski's second fallacy. It's the mapping of a map to another map. But simply avoiding these fallacies isn't sufficient. We still must explain the very nature of maps. <coughs> what constitutes a map? What constitutes a mapping relationship? Not one that I do, mapping something onto something else, like we do with computers. But what's going on in me, for example? The map territory distinction hides the fact that there is not a separate non-physical realm of maps, Descartes' res cogitans. That there's not a process is discontinuous with the physical world territories that we are mapping. Um, I'm a physical being. I'm doing the mapping. It's a physical process. Um, yes, there's a map territory distinction, but the map is also a territory, which is exactly why you can map a map to a map. <laughs> so the unanswered question is, how can one territory come to embody a mapping of another? Well, there was another attempt to do this, to answer this. This comes from the late 1940s, early 1950s, the development of what's oftentimes these days still called cybernetics. Um, and the question is, does cybernetics solve this problem? Does it create a meaning? How would it do that? Um, Gregory Bateson, one of my teachers, um, described the information in a cybernetic process as a difference that makes a difference. This turns out to be built upon an idea that was developed by a man named Claude Shannon uh, in the late 1940s, working for Bell Labs, who is responsible for what we today call information theory. Um, this is probably the simplest cybernetic system that almost every cybernetic book begins with. Um, this is a thermostat, the old kind of thermostat. We don't have these anymore. We have all kinds of fancy electronic versions. But the old kind that used to be around when I was a kid, um, they used a little mercury switch. And this is shown here over. Uh, on the right. Uh, it's a little hollow tube and it's got a little bub bubble of mercury in it, a little ball of mercury. Mercury conducts electricity. And you have two leads of wire going into here and there's a circuit here. It runs through this furnace. It can turn on or turn off the furnace. It's got power going into it. But if these leads are not connected, of course, the circuit is broken. Well, what happens is you hook this little switch onto a bimetallic strip in which uh, the two metals contract or expand differently in terms of changes of temperature. And so if it contracts, if it expands this way, then one of the things that's happened is that it causes the mercury ball to roll down this way. And it disconnects uh, the circuit, turning off the furnace. However, if it contracts, which happens when it gets colder and colder and colder, eventually the mer mercury bubble will roll down here, the little dollop of mercury, connect the switch, turn on the furnace. So now what's happening in this process? We've got a difference that makes a difference. 
In other words, what's happening is that a difference in the position of the switch produces a difference in the way current is flowing through the circuit, which produces a difference in the activity in the furnace burning fuel, which produces a difference in the temperature of the room, which put, produces a difference in the coiling of this bimetallic strip, which produces a difference in the position of the mercury, and so on and so on and so on. A difference that's making a difference around the circuit. Um, the question is, is anything causing, anything sending information to anything else? Or is this just a mechanical process in which we, on the outside, superimpose and saying, well, isn't the switch providing information about uh, the activity of the furnace? Isn't this bimetallic strip causing, uh, providing information about the temperature of the room? Well, the answer here is that it's not quite doing that exactly. It's me interpreting that. And uh, what happens is that the cyberneticians um, along with a number of other folks, came up with another term. A man named Pittendridge came up with this term. Teleonomy, not teleology, but teleonomy. That is, the convergence of a system towards a selected arbitrary state. It tends to go towards this state whenever it's perturbed away from it. In other words, you make it cold and it gets hot again. You make it hot and it gets cold again. Um, it tends to go this way. And, and of course, guidance systems work this way. All kinds of things work this way. I should add that many features of your body work this way as well. But to create this required a function. You had to want to have this. There had to be some reason that you wanted to set this point, this temperature, where it is. The structure was produced by an outside teleology. So that the information in there, the purpose in there, is in a sense parasitic on the designer. Now, what's interesting about this is that there's nothing intrinsic to all of these linkages in this circuit that's about anything else. Really, the coiling of the strip is not about temperature. It just causes a coiling of the strip when the temperature changes. It's not about changing the temperature of the room. This is what I want. Only an extrinsic agent that's got these teleological features going on, that wants something, that has an end in mind put this together. And it's not simply resolved, as some have suggested, by embedding a cybernetic system in yet a larger cybernetic system. In fact, this is another kind of vicious regress, a version that's a little bit like the homunculus regress. So for example, if the designers of cybernetic systems are themselves merely cybernetic systems, then what's the source of the extrinsic determination of what it refers to? What's doing the mapping? And for what end? In other words, yeah, I can, I can expand the game outward as well. Put a cybernetic system controlled by a larger cybernetic system, controlled by a larger, you were never going to solve it that way either. This doesn't get us out of the problem. There's another way to see why this is a problem, but maybe to see a way back into the answer. Um, one of my favorite examples of a cybernetic system that wasn't designed you might call it an accidental cybernetic system, is the old faithful geyser in Yellowstone Park. Why is it an accidental cybernetic system? Because its causality keeps the temperature and pressure within certain ranges. When the temperature and pressure goes to a certain level, it blows out the water, allowing new cold water to come in and get warmed up. It keeps itself, like any thermostat does, within certain bounds. But so what distinguishes an organism that does this kind of thing from old faithful geyser? And the answer is it's pretty simple. What distinguishes organisms from these inorganic or even these man-made cybernetic systems is that the regulatory behaviors of organisms contribute to the organization of the very structures that generate them. In other words, the function of the thermostat in your room plays no role in maintaining or producing its own organization. That organization is produced extrinsically. The whole purpose behind it, the design, is outside the process. But in organisms, their very activity is involved in generating the structure that makes that activity possible. It's a kind of self-referential feature. And what I want to do is to capture that. So I'm going to have two hypotheses here, and I'm going to try to spell them out in simple terms. I'm not going to produce anything that, where there's anything up my sleeves. 
going to try to make this as simple as I possibly can. The first hypothesis is the system exhibits what we sometimes call teleofunctional. I like to use, I invented a term, intentional. Um, don't worry about it. A property, that is something that has a function or a purpose or an end. Um, uh, what are those kinds of properties? A system exhibits this only if the constraints that are generated by its organization, by what it does, its dynamical organization, plays a role that's a primary constitutive role in generating and or preserving that very same organization, which includes the same category to generate these constraints. It's a kind of circularity, but a, but a higher order kind of circularity than you see in the circularity of a cybernetic system. It's a cybernetic system that builds its own cybernetics, so to speak. The second hypothesis, which I will only hint at as we move along here, is that semiosis, that is reference, meaning, significance generation, only occurs in systems where absent extrinsic factors play a role in the production of the system's intentional or teleofunctional organization. In other words, systems that need something from the outside to have this capacity. What I'm going to argue is that all systems that have this capacity need things from the outside. Um, this becomes the basis, the ground, so to speak, uh, upon which reference, meaning, and value can grow from. And something else even more fundamental, self. And in fact, the distinction of self and other. We often say, OK, you know, that table itself stands by itself. Well, there's no self there in any clear sense. Uh, you know, it's a way of just identifying something separate. But what I mean by self is, of course, the kind of self that an organism has, a kind of self that's, that, in a sense, makes itself, that creates itself. Self only exists with respect to an implicit representation, something that is not itself. Self exists because there's something that's not it, and that it has to be organized with respect to what that is. Um, a, a famous biologist, uh, Jacob von Uxkel, um, uh, called this the Umwelt, the specific relevant world of the self. There's lots of things in our world that's not relevant to me. Um, so in fact, our sensory systems don't pick up ultraviolet light because for the most part, the ultraviolet light in the world isn't relevant to me unless I'm laying out on the beach getting a sunburn. Um, uh, it's not part of my umwelt in that sense. It's not part of the, the relevant world. My senses have been adapted to know about the relevant world, or the most of the relevant world. Subjective experience, that experience that we sometimes call consciousness, I like the word interiority. That is, the sense of being inside, of being other than something assumes a teleology of self with respect to non-self. <coughs> so the problem of teleology, the problem of final cause, <coughs> is the problem of representation. It's the problem of self. It's the problem of value and meaning. So if we can't resolve that problem, we're not going to get started at what's the root problem of mistaking the territory and the map for each other. Um, what about selves? I happen to be what, we, what people still like to call an emergentist, someone who thinks that new things show up in the world over time. It's not too hard to believe that. They certainly keep doing so, in our, even in our technological world. But one of my favorite statements of this comes from the philosopher Daniel Dennett. He says, now there are selves. There was a time, thousands or millions or billions of years ago, when there were none, at least none on this planet. So there has to be as a matter of logic, a true story to be told about how there came to be creatures with selves. So I want today to tell you how I think there came to be creatures with selves that exhibit teleology. I think we've been hoodwinked by what I call a Zeno's paradox of the mind. Does everybody remember Zeno's paradox? Um, Zeno's paradox is that swift Achilles in a race with a tortoise who's given a, you know, a one-yard head start, doesn't seem to be able to ever pass the tortoise. Why? Because every time Achilles is caught up to half the distance between him and the tortoise, the tortoise has moved ahead a few inches. Oh, OK. So every time Achilles cuts, cuts half of that distance, well, the tortoise has moved a little bit further. And every time he cuts half of that distance, the tortoise has moved a little bit further. 
it looks as though there's an infinite number of halves that he can never catch up with the tortoise. Of course, we know that uh, within just a few strides, Achilles passes the tortoise. Zeno's paradox is that logically, as I try to analyze this, it looks like it's an infinitely impossible task. And yet we know that it's absolutely true. What I want to say is that I think we've been trapped in what I call a Zeno's paradox of the mind. Zeno's paradox, as Zeno put it, was resolved by discovering how to calculate with zero and how to calculate with infinity. Now you might say, wait, that's crazy. You can't calculate with zero infinity. Um, zero, of course, is a way of representing what's absent, what's not there, a quantity that doesn't exist. The problem with zero, and in fact it was a real problem in Western mathematics until the late Middle Ages, is that it does bad things when you put it into math. You know, divide anything by zero and what do you get? <sighs> it's terrible. It's a number that doesn't work like other numbers. Um, we got to find something else to do. And so zero was left out again and again and again. Calculating with zero is what the brilliance of Leibniz and Newton was about. Discovering the calculus was about figuring out how we can calculate with infinities or infinitely small quantities. That you can do it for a variety of reasons. You just have to think about it differently. You can't treat it like you treat every other number. Now, I'm not going to give you a calculus lesson here, so you can go back to your math teacher and ask what I mean by this. Um, but uh, the simple answer is that we now know that at an instance, we can know the velocity of a missile flying through space at a moment, somewhere in its trajectory, even though velocity is a measure of distance per time. So if it's traveled no time and gone no distance, how can there be a velocity at a point? Well, of course, there's a velocity to point. I'll leave that one to you. But here's the Zeno's paradox of the mind. I want to show you the parallel here. No amount of material explanation seems to provide an account of subjectivity, of our conscious experience. Why I have it. With each added datum about neuroscience or whatever, the question, why is there experience, can still be asked. It seems like we haven't reduced it any. Every time we know something else about the brain, we progressively refine our analysis of mental causality by looking at how this neuron works with that neuron and this group of neurons fires when that group of neurons is quiet. Um, the more we get about this, the more pre precise details we get about it, we never seem to cross the threshold. We're getting closer and closer, infinite numbers of steps, and we never seem to get there. It's just more mechanism, more mechanism, more mechanism. It doesn't seem like we've got conscious experience in there. That's the Zeno's paradox of the mind. I think we're stuck there. But Zeno's paradox was solved. I'm going to take it fairly simple and minimal today. Because the real question is difficult. Um, Manning Howard Petit calls the problem the problem of the epistemic cut. When is it in nature that we need to talk about something like knowledge, something like representation. Well, of course, classically, Descartes thought it had to do with um, what he called the res cogitans, the mind. And so he identified the body with mechanism and the mind with meaning. And he said, that's where the cut is. Bodies are just robotic things. More recently, Two people who've influenced me, Gregory Bateson on top and Howard Petit down below, um, make the cut somewhere differently. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. Because it's simpler and easier to understand. Gregory Bateson calls this the difference between pleroma, which is the physical world of sort of Newton's kind of world, and creatura, the biological world. It's the distinction between life and non-life. Living things, even really, really, really simple living things, simple bacteria, have cells. They're organized around the maintenance and the reproduction of themselves, of the qualities that they possess. To do that, they have, there's something like minimal teleology. 
Now, many people, as I said, have tried to explain away organisms and evolution by saying, oh, there's no end to evolution. Evolution is not a teleological process. In fact, what I would argue is I think even Darwin knew that his story didn't fully resolve the issue. And I'm going to pick on the very last line of The Origin of Species to make this point. In the closing line, Darwin cryptically acknowledges that the process of natural selection, his process of evolution, is insufficient to account for the core attributes of life. Thus, he begins the poetic last line this way. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. Dot, dot, dot. Everybody quotes the last half of this. I'm not going to quote it for you. Um, all the wonderful things happen because of this. The question is, natural selection doesn't explain the origins of these several powers. Wait a minute. The several powers have to be breathed into things before natural selection can even work. Organisms evade something that all of nature fails to evade, the second law of thermodynamics, the fact that things just spontaneously fall into mess. To keep things organized and ordered, you've got to do work. Organisms evade that. They reproduce themselves. The process of being able to produce something that beats the second law of thermodynamics, at least locally, for a short period of time, even dumping heat into the world, nevertheless, but locally, keeping yourself ahead of the game, so to speak. That's what organisms do. If you can't do that, if you can't reproduce not only the information by copying the information, but build the structure that interprets that information, and at the same time, produce more organization. If you can't do that, evolution can't occur. This is why Darwin never talked about the origins of life. In fact, he did everything he could to avoid answering people who wrote him letters about, well, how does evolution explain how life started? He didn't want to answer it for a good reason. It's a really difficult question. And it is very simple. The origin of life did not occur by natural selection. Natural selection is a consequence, not a cause. So what I'm going to do is to try to talk about the origins of life. Now, whether this is the real origins of life story or not, um, I'm going to tell you about a model system that we've been working on and playing with that captures what I think are the essential details that need to be captured by any origins of life story, which are a story about the origins of teleology, the origins of function, the origins of self. So let me start with an interesting conundrum about those things that we're interested in here. A function is not a property that's intrinsic to any physical mechanism. It's not in the mechanism. And it's not even an aspect of its actual operation. The function is not some physical thing that's going on. Yes, it's a physical process, but the function is, a, is an end that the mechanism accomplishes. A meaning is not the sound of the word not the shape of the letters, nor the material that they're composed of, nor even the way these physical tokens affect neural activities in the brain. In fact, a thought about something is not an intrinsic physical attribute of a brain, nor is it any neuronal state or event. Neuronal processes represent the content to other neuronal processes. The thought is to the brain process as a meaning is to a word. What brains are doing is they're representing something. They're not it. Again, it's a map territory issue. The brain is, yeah, it's a map. Where's the territory? The question is, how does that relationship get established? What is that relationship? As I said, I like to call these intentional phenomena. I, I created the word because it's a little bit like the word intentional. Um, but intentional has a much more restricted meaning. Each of these things I just described, a function, a meaning, a thought, is constituted with respect to something explicitly non-intrinsic and not even actualized. It's not there. A function is not there in the stuff. The meaning is not there in the words. It's not the words. And it's not in the world either. 
Yet without these relationships to something absent, those things I just described would be just physical, material interactions, inert objects in the world. Just below this, I have a quote from Franz Brentano in the 19th century, who really begins thinking about psychology in a phenomenolo phenomenological way. Um, he's really the father of this kind of thinking about um, meaning in psychology, so to speak. Here's what he says. Every mental phenomenon is characterized by what the scholastics of the Middle Ages called the intentional or mental inexistence of an object. I highlight these two words, particularly in existence. What the heck does he mean by in existence? Um, and what we might call, though not wholly unambiguously, reference to a content. It's this concept of in existence I want to get at, because I think he's right. And I think he's right to choose this weird word that he creates. So let me talk about some trivial examples where in existence actually matters in the world. In fact, I'm going to go back to some mysticism here. This is the Tao Te Ching, number 11, if you want to look it up. This is, this is my um, version of it. I can't say I'm a, uh, anyone that can translate Chinese, but this is my version of it anyway. Um, 30 spokes converge at the wheels hub to an empty space that allows it to turn. Clay is shaped into a vessel to take advantage of the emptiness it surrounds. Doors and windows are cut into the walls of a room so that a protected space can be occupied. Though we must work with what is there, use comes from what is not there. This is the essence. If you get this idea that was known 3,000 years ago, you've got the essence of my argument about how we're going to understand teleology in the world, how we're going to understand meaning and function in the self. So let's, let's get back to function. Function is an absence. It's not an addition. The function of a machine is determined by the constraints, the limitations on the dynamical excursions that its parts can assume. Changing these constraints to include degrees of freedom, of movements, of interactions that are beyond a given threshold, it will result in the loss of function. The system will break down. The system breaks down not because we added something to it, but because we allowed it to do more things. We allowed some degrees of freedom. It's the absence of those degrees of freedom that the function adheres in. Think about life. It's also defined by absence. A living organism consists of a vast and complex system of reciprocally synthesized molecules. The stability of this reciprocal closure depends on their possible interactions being highly constrained. Things can't happen. Though we think of death as the loss of something, what is lost is this constraint. As many degrees of freedom of chemical interactions are restored and the entropy increases. Death is not the loss of something, not the loss of freedom, so to speak. It's the gain of chemical freedom, just a loss of freedom at my level and your level. So what I'm trying to impose here is to get you to think negatively about these problems, to think about the other side of things, the flip side of the coin. Because I'm going to talk about the concept of emergence, how novel things come into the world as less, not more. It's been argued since the time of Aristotle that we must think of a complex whole, like an organism, as greater than the sum of its parts, or even transcending its parts. I think it's been the source of a great confusion. Because it risks committing the fallacy of causal redundancy. That is, how does the whole do causal things that the parts don't do? Isn't the whole just made up of parts and their interactions? So where do you get this extra causality? Where do you get the extra stuff that makes the whole? Well, I'm going to suggest that we invert this aphorism. So this is where, you know, I'm like Korzybski, going to say, Aristotle, I, I think you're wrong about this one. The whole is less than the sum of its parts and all their possible interactions. Think about that in terms of life. Think about that in terms of a machine. Higher order phenomena with novel, that is, emergent properties, are going to be described here as the expression of constraints, losses of degrees of freedom. 
things that are not allowed to happen. Less is more. So I, I talk about emergence in a special way. It's my own way of doing it. Um, other people use the term in other ways. I think most people use it too sloppy. I'm trying to be really precise. And in that respect, I'll only talk about three ways of talking about this, this concept. Um, I use three terms, homeodynamics, morphodynamics, teleodynamics. Don't let your eyes glaze glow, over yet. This is not quite that, you know, that crazy. Um, homeodynamics is just things going to equilibrium, things going to their lowest energy state, things going into a mess, not being organized. That's the second law of thermodynamics. It's homeodynamic. Homeo meaning that it goes towards some more even distribution. The, the most general feature of the cosmos is that it's egalitarian in the sense that things just tend to just get evenly distributed. Nothing is better, nothing is more appropriately organized than anything else. Everything tends to fall into a mess. However, there are special cases, and I want to talk about those special cases, because they have become really an exciting part of science in the last uh, few decades. And I call this morphodynamics, change processes that produce regularities or forms. Morphology, it's morpho. It turns out that these are processes we sometimes call self-organizing, where things get organized seemingly without an organizer. The term self is probably a uh, loaded term here, and I'll come back to that in a second. I want to describe some of these things. But it turns out that all these self-organizing processes are actually the result of thermodynamic processes interacting in interesting interesting ways in which thermodynamics sort of works against itself. And finally, I'm going to talk about a third level. And that's the level that has produced you and me. I call it teleodynamics, end-directed dynamics. Living processes, evolutionary processes, semiotic mental processes, these are all teleodynamic. They are directed towards a specific end. And they spontaneously pursue those ends. So I want to talk about um, a basic universal asymmetry. Here's a depiction of four frames from a movie. You all know, looking at this, the order that this takes place. Right? <clears throat> if I had suggested that the one on the bottom right is first and the next one on the left, the bottom left is next, following this arrow, you would say, ah, ah, not true. Couldn't have happened that way. Um, when you send this little white ball whamming into this nice, neat triangle of balls in the top left. It's bound to get distributed out. Things tend to go one way and not the other way. This is the basic universal asymmetry, the homeodynamic asymmetry. Things are organized, they're consolidated, they're in one place, and they get distributed around. What's interesting, we call this the second law of thermodynamics. It's not an inex inexorable law. It's a tendency. The universe has a tendency. A law is something that can't be violated. But the second law of thermodynamics is a tendency. It's a statistical tendency. It's an astronomical tendency. But it's a tendency. And what is merely probable, even if it's vastly, vastly universally probable, can be violated locally by precisely organized work. One of the things that I and a colleague have thought about doing, we've never done it, by the way, but we've thought about doing it, is that these are four frames from a movie we took in which we could measure the velocity and the direction of each of these balls after the pool ball hit it and split these apart. See where they ended up. We know how they got there, how fast they were moving. And we can estimate the amount of friction involved in slowing them down until they moved. And that means if we were really, really, really careful, we could set up a bunch of little activators at each ball to blink them from the bottom right in just the right velocities and just the right directions so they would all pop together and pop out this little white cue ball. Now, what I'm saying here is it's not impossible. It's really, really hard. Um, uh, and I don't suggest we do it, but on the other hand, what I want to suggest is 
This is what life does. Because the second law of thermodynamics is not inexorable. It can go the other way. Just very, very, very unlikely in very, very unusual circumstances. And to do so requires a lot of work. And that work produces other thermodynamic losses elsewhere. But what I'm going to argue here is that this most basic asymmetry of the universe is also the source for all other temporal asymmetries. That's where things go even backwards, get more organized. That it's actually all the result of this one asymmetry. This is a way of saying, what I'm trying to say here is that the very fact that one of the most basic features of the universe is that things tend to get messy is precisely what makes it possible for things to get organized and for things to even work to produce something that doesn't yet exist. Pretty, pretty big order, I realize. Let me talk about a couple of morphodynamic processes, or sometimes called self-organized processes. Um, three of them that I want to just sort of focus your attention on, I'm only going to talk about two of them. One of them's a little bit complicated. But one on the top, Raleigh Bernard convection. I'll talk about this in just a second. Um, it turns out that simply heating liquids can sometimes cause them to be highly, highly regular in their organization, in their movements. Um, lasers, you know, those things that we got pens made up of and we, you know, use in our computers and, you know, they read CDs and things like that. Um, lasers are the result also of a morphodynamic process. The reason that we can pump white light into these systems and out comes highly regularized, single frequency, tightly aligned light waves is because of the self-organizing processes. Noise in did not produce noise out. Noise in produced organization out. Because what happened is that the system amplified its regularities. By light bouncing back and forth within this little tube, um, it caused more frequencies of light closer to the original frequency that these little molecules tend to give off to amplify and amplify and amplify. Constraints increased, not decreased. The second law of thermodynamics is about constraints, things being aligned, decreasing, things becoming more disordered. The laser is a case in which we pour disordered light in, and by continually pumping more disordered light in, we actually produce ordered light out. And of course, everybody's favorite example, it seems to me, is snow crystals. Snow crystals grow remarkable symmetries as they fall through the sky um, precisely because they multiply constraints. They multiply the limitations of where the next water molecule can accrete in the crystal lattice. And as they grow, they become more and more and more regular. In fact, it's been recently found that if you take an electron microscope that can look at things that are very cold, and you look at the microstructure inside of a snow crystal, it's totally randomized. It's the larger case of the snow crystal. Now, large, I mean, you know, as tiny as snow crystals are. Um, that's macroscopic compared to an atom uh, or a molecule of water. Uh, nevertheless, it's only at, the, at that scale that they're highly organized. So let me talk about a couple of these. Because these are the stepping stones that we have to understand before we can get to life, before we can get to purpose. It's called raleigh bernard convection. This is a case in which you take a, a round dish here, like a Petri dish, you put in a thin layer of oil, and you heat it up from the bottom. Heat it up nice and evenly. What happens is as it heats up hotter and hotter, it's giving off the heat off the top of this surface of oil. And eventually, over time, as you get hotter and hotter, it begins to regularize, forms these little shakes. Because it's oil, it's not going to boil. It's giving off heat. And before long, if you kept it regular and you keep pumping in heat, it becomes so highly regular that the surface becomes broken up into hexagons. Nice, beautiful hexagons like this. What's happening when it's in this state is the heat's coming up and it causes oil molecules to rise from the from the middle, um, they're actually lighter. The oil is lighter because it's expanded. And as it gives off its heat on the top, it cools off, gets heavier, and it falls down. 
Uh, it regularizes because of the constraint of giving off heat. In order to give off heat faster than it can just by radiating it off, just by what we call conduction, by having one molecule bump into another, bump into another, and randomly give off the heat. In order to give it off faster, because you're heating it faster than conduction can get rid of it, molecules begin moving. And now they can go from the bottom to the top very quickly, give off their heat, go pick it up again, so to speak. Why is it hexagonal? Because hexagonal close packing is the most efficient way to produce surfaces and edges on a flat surface. It's going towards its most efficient way of getting rid of the energy that's perturbing it. It's regularized by disturbing it. That's how self-organization, or morphodynamics, the production of dynamical form, works. Perturbation that regularizes itself. Now, what's interesting is I want to say that living processes use this all the time. One of the favorites of most people studying animals and plants particularly plants here, um, is this Fibonacci spiral. Everybody knows the Fibonacci sequence. Um, uh, and, and what we see here is that the surface of, of lots of plants have nice regular spirals. And in fact, if we look at the opposite spirals, they're adjacent Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci number is a number that's created in a sequence by adding the previous two numbers in the sequence. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, and so on. Um, Fibonacci numbers produce this remarkable feature. Why do plants fall into this Fibonacci spiral fit system? It's because it's, in effect, the most efficient way to grow from the center out. It's where space filling is most uniform for things that are growing at a constant rate. So we see when we close, take a close-up view, where is the next one growing? It actually is growing in the place where there's the most space, the most nutrients, and so on. Um, what's interesting about the Fibonacci spiral shape is that it's not encoded in the genome of plants. The Fibonacci spiral is a self-organizing process. We know this because, in this case here, little bits of magnetic material were dripped on the top of balls um, that were charged. And they repel each other. But they repel each other in this beautiful Fibonacci way because they fill the space most evenly from the center out. Um, it turns out that all life has to do is to capture this morphodynamic process. If you want to produce a lot of order as easy as possible, take advantage of self-organizing processes. If you want to generate order without doing all the extra work that it would take to constrain and limit things to the way you want it, just take advantage of a morphodynamic process. What the genes are doing, in effect, is they're capturing these kinds of processes, capturing them by virtue of capturing um, certain threshold values, for example, <coughs> of chemistry and so on. Um, but here's the problem in moving to life. How do you remember it? How do you preserve it? In the growth of a snow crystal, the constraints that are built up, the regularities, are preserved because the thing freezes. Unfortunately, freezing is not dynamic. The regularity is produced by dynamics, but it can't be reproduced again. We have to start over. This snow crystal can't give birth to another snow crystal. The order is lost as soon as it begins to melt. It's capturing its history in some sense also. This is this kind of time binding, maybe, in a sense. What's going on here is that each different part of the atmosphere that it falls through has a different temperature and humidity and pressure. And it turns out slightly different crystal growth parameters occur in different temperature, humidity, and pressure zones. And so in effect, the growth of a snow crystal is actually a record, a memory, a binding of the constraints that are produced previously. But as each constraint is produced, it limits what can happen next. And as it limits the next one, as the next one limits the next one, and the next one limits the next one, it becomes more and more ordered. You're compounding constraints, adding more limitations. So to move to life, I want to go back to um, another philosopher, Immanuel Kant. And in fact, a number of people have used his ideas in an idea that's called autopoiesis. I won't tell you what that means at this point. I will tell you what it means, but I won't tell you all about the, the theory. Autopoiesis means 
uh, to make itself, basically, to fabricate itself. Life does that, and that's an important part of the story. Immanuel Kant actually caught on to this back in 18, I mean in 1790. He says here, this is from his um, uh, critique of teleological judgment, one of the very last things he wrote. A machine has solely motive power, whereas an organized being, a living organism, possesses inherent formative power, and such moreover as it can impart to material devoid of it, material which it organizes. This, therefore, is a self-propagating formative power in which every part is reciprocally both ends and means. Now, he sneaks in this term ends and means, terms ends and means here. He knows that he sneaks it in. And in fact, the rest of this argument is to say, I snuck this in. Um, but he says there's something unusual about organisms. They look like they have ends. They look like they have ends and means to accomplish those ends. Um, but it's really just me looking at the physical material process. So he concludes that this reciprocity is merely a resemblance to teleology. He says it's transcendentally perceived. It's not there in, it's not intrinsic teleology. And the reason for this is very simple. That the unity and agency of the organism why something is together is not explained simply by all the parts making each other. The question is, why do the parts make each other? Why is it closed like this? That's not explained here. And you need that piece to explain self. And you need it to explain teleology, true intrinsic teleology. So I want to talk about an example of parts making each other. And this is one of the things that's been famously studied for years and years. Um, here we see a molecule bumping into another molecule and breaking it apart. The yellow stuff is the transfer of energy as it gets broken apart. But imagine that this one, which we call a catalyst, because it didn't get changed in the process, um, produces another molecule that's a catalyst to cause another reaction to break. And in this reaction, it produces the first catalyst, which can now break another molecule. And you get a circle of catalysis, of which catalysts make more catalysts. This is a process that can speed up and speed up and speed up. Why? Because you're adding more of the molecules that speed up the process. This is sometimes called autocatalytic auto sets of molecules or reciprocal catalysis. It turns out that all of life uses reciprocal catalysis like this, from the Krebs cycle that produces the energy in our bodies to all kinds of processes that generate things. It's, as a result, a morphodynamic process that produces more and more constraint. There's a second morphodynamic process I want to talk about that's ubiquitous to life. It's self-assembly. Viruses don't put themselves together. They effectively fall together. They fall together in the way crystals form spontaneously because molecules have certain shapes and charges and affinities that causes them to fit together into regular assemblies. So the shell of a virus that contains the RNA or DNA molecules that are so troublesome is made up of molecules that, because of their shape, fall together, in this case, in a sort of buckyball kind of look here. Um, the surfaces of every cell is made up of also self-assembly processes, molecules that are organized with respect to each other because only these yellow and orange ends um, uh, are able to bind with water. These green tails um, are like oil. They're uh, hydrophobic. That is, they can't bind with water and they resist water. As a result, all the hydrophobic tails fit together, all the hydrophilic ends stick out, and you get a cell wall. Uh, you get a cell membrane, I'm so sorry, in which there's water outside, water inside, but nothing can get through, unless you have a special pore. Inside of cells, lots of the structure of a cell is made up of these long little tubes. You can see here stained in a kind of greenish stain. Here we see uh, a cartoon of how they're forming and unforming. Um, these are called tubulin molecules. Tubulin molecules, um, in the right circumstances, just tend to stick together. And they produce these spontaneous tubes. Change the conditions and the tubes fall apart. Self-assembly and reciprocal catalysis. Why do I talk about these two? They're ubiquitous in life. It's because the two of these morphodynamic processes that produce regularities have a kind of synergy with respect to each other. That synergy is, is captured here um, in these mapped relationships. That is, reciprocal catalysis produces high local asymmetric concentrations of just a few number of molecules, types of molecules. 
But to produce self-assembly, you need a lot of the same molecules in the same place, exactly the kind of thing that reciprocal catalysis produces. On the other hand, um, to have reciprocal catalysis, the molecules have to be near each other. They have to work with respect to each other. They can't diffuse away from each other, or it stops. But producing a self-assembled shell like a virus container keeps things from diffusing away. Each of these processes each of these processes produces what the other needs in order to exist, to persist. So with just these two processes to think about, we've created a series of models. In this case, they're mostly conceptual models, computer models, and so on. Um, we hope to make them chemical models soon. Um, that very, very simply put these two things together. So that the red things are the catalysts that are making copies of themselves, but also produce a side product that can assemble into a shell or into a tube. In so doing, the, the containers are most likely to contain the molecules that make the containers and that make themselves. Now what's interesting about this is that just it's a probability. You've made it a really high probability that something will form that will contain what's needed to make itself if it's broken again. So this thing gets busted up again by heat in the environment or whatever. And what will happen? It will spill out its catalysts. If the catalysts find substrates in the surround, they'll start the process over again and recontain themselves. In other words, this is a system that can repair itself. Not only that, if you smear it out a little bit, all the parts will start to make maybe two or three. In a sense, it's reproducing itself. No DNA, <coughs> nothing like life, no metabolism here, though there's some chemistry involved. Um, this is a very, very, very simple chemical system that I would argue has a kind of very primitive self. Why would I say this? Because it's dynamics produces the form that makes this dynamics possible. That was the argument I made about what's missing in Old Faithful. So here's one way of thinking about it sort of abstractly. The boundary conditions, the conditions that are necessary for each of these two processes, self-assembly and reciprocal catalysis, are each produced by the other process. Each process is a morphodynamic process. It produces constraints, regularities, limitations. But those are precisely what are produced by one that the other needs to get started or to be maintained or to reproduce itself. But there's something interesting here. It's the reciprocity between these, what you might call the synergy between these, that makes it possible. It's not just the constraints that they produce. It's the constraint of the relationship between these constraint-generating processes. Now, maybe a little hard to say that uh, more than once. This is a constraint, however, that's multiply realizable. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that um, if the system breaks up and reforms again, there's new stuff. This constraint is now embodied by new stuff. And in fact, if other kinds of molecules get involved in this, get Inter intertwined in the process, um, it might produce slightly different synergies between the processes. But the thing that makes the, the, the unit stay together, I call it an autogenic unit, it makes, it generates itself, is this synergy constraint. And this constraint is not a particular chemical constraint. It's a formal relationship between kinds of chemical constraints. And that's what gets passed on. If this system reproduces, if it breaks up and makes two of them, they both get it. It's been passed on. It's been replicated. It's, in a sense, it's the information that holds the system together. I'm going to skip this one. It's a little bit too much. Um, I'm sorry, but we're, I'm, I'm very late here, so I don't want you to go to sleep on me. I'm about to end. So what I want to say is that I call this process teleodynamics. Like morphodynamics is made by the relationships in which competing thermodynamic relationships are interacting in just the right way, as in the Bernard cell example. 
convection cell. Um, teleodynamics is by having morphodynamic processes, self-organizing processes, um, formative powers interacting in just the right way. And when they do so, they create a higher order constraint, an abstract or formal constraint between types of constraint producing processes. Much more complicated. But as a result, an autogenic system like this is individuated. It's described by a very specific finite structure. And a finite structure that it will reproduce if busted up. In this respect, it has a kind of self. It has a dynamics organized with respect to itself, with respect to exactly those features that make that dynamics possible. It produces a kind of maintenance of its own systemic integrity. It has a logic of repair by synthesizing its own parts and reintegrating them. It has a disposition or tendency to initiate self-reconstituting processes or dynamics whenever the system's integration is degraded. In other words, it keeps itself integrated. It keeps itself. And in so doing, it creates the maintenance of distinct self, non-self distinction. That self is defined not by the chemistry, not by the stuff, but by the formal relationship that's created here. A relationship because it's formal that can be passed from material to material. And this means that self itself is multiply realizable. It can be realized in different ways simply by interactions of this kind of self-organizing process. It's substrate transferable, it's multiply realizable, and it's formal. And it constitutes the continuity of an individual over time. It's what literally constitutes an individual self. And it's the information that gets reproduced and transmitted in a lineage. And this self-other distinction is what creates an umwelt because there's only some things in the world that are relevant to its dynamics, other things that are not. It identifies something about the world by virtue of its dynamics, by virtue of this self-organization, true self-production. And it's because this self-other distinction exists that there's a very primitive kind of interiority. That is, that there's things going on inside that don't go on outside, but depend upon. So what I'm going to argue here is that teleodynamics pr provides, even in this very, very simple model, not the kind of purposiveness that you and I exhibit, but at the origins of life. And I would argue that this is the kind of way that life has to start. Why does life have to start this way? Because two things. Life had to start very, very simply. And the second thing is it had to completely reverse a universal, ubiquitous thermodynamic tendency. These two things had to come together. It had to be simple, and it had to reverse the second law of thermodynamics locally. That's what happens in this simple system. Any origins of life story, I think, has to capture these principles. But once it does, all these other things follow. There's a self-other distinction. There's in individuation. It's finite. It's located somewhere. It's located in space and time. It has function. Each of the ways that the parts work do something for some reason and, or for some purpose, for some end. And the end is, of course, maintaining the system. It's the origin of distinctive causal effects in the world, distinctive to that individual. And it's normative. What do I mean by normative? Because it can fail. It can perish or persist. Its processes can, can succeed or fail at producing this. It can, in effect, interact inappropriately with molecules that it shouldn't interact with, so to speak. Because although the chemistry looks the same, it doesn't produce the same consequences. So in effect, there's something like good and bad here, even. I'm going to argue that this, in fact, though not intentionality in the sense of you and, my, you and I, is, in fact, 
the intentionality um, that we want to begin to describe in the world. <coughs> so what I've tried to do here is to say that teleodynamic organization is sufficient to produce autonomous agency, to produce a functional self, other distinction. And it's necessary to produce functional interiority. That is, the, the, what goes on inside is different than what's on the outside a perspective of inside to outside. And I'm going to argue here, though I haven't told you why, that it's necessary to have this kind of thing in order to assign reference and value to something extrinsic to itself, to represent. You need these features in order to have this. But here's the interesting thing. Teleodynamics can emerge in many different substrates and at many different levels of scale. I will only describe the simplest version of this. In fact, I want to argue that teleodynamic systems can also be components in higher order homeodynamic, morphodynamic, and teleodynamic processes. Each of your neurons is teleodynamic, is indirected, is like a living cell. It is a living cell that has goals, so to speak, even though they're vegetative kinds of goals. Your consciousness and my consciousness is the result of a teleodynamics made of teleodynamics. We are, in this <coughs> sense, truly final causal structures of the world. Purpose exists, and as a result, value exists, and it's physically understandable. It's not in some separate spiritual realm or some mysterious realm. It's part of the world. It's just that absent part of the world. So I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you.